spirit. Uh, we thank you because you are God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and um, you have sovereignty over our lives and what you are doing in this world. We ask you, Lord, to help us as we meditate upon thy word, uh, take our hearts and minds and eyes and ears and and rule over our lives so we can meet you as you have been uh, described and revealed in us and to us through thy scripture. We pray in the name of you. Amen. So as, as we um, come to the scriptures tonight, we would like to open our Bibles to Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, um, chapter um, 11. Uh, we will be uh, looking at one verse that we have seen. Uh, <clears throat> the folks that wanted to blame Jesus used to um, bring him down. And they called him this man who is a friend of sinners. Matthew eleven nineteen. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. They use this phrase to ridicule him. They use this phrase to bring shame to him. They use this phrase to uh, bring him down in front of uh, his friends and his uh, countrymen. They use this phrase to, uh, to discount his message. Um, but this phrase became the chief cornerstone of his ministry. He, he became uh, a friend of you and I, a sinner. And this is the ministry of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who has come down and has become um, our friend. So the phrase that people use to shame him has become his chief ministry. Uh, this is the name they gave him to reproach him, to bring ridicule to him. And this is the name which portrayed his very essence, his very glory, his very mission. Jesus Christ is friend of sinners. As we spoke last time, uh, there are six reasons why I believe Jesus Christ is the friend of sinners. Six reasons. Um, he he um, is a friend of sinners of six reasons. The first reason uh, we find uh, is in um, Gospel of Matthew. As we look at his um, proof, uh, for loving us sinners, the first proof that he loved sinners was by his incarnation. And we looked at it last time. Uh, we're talking about real sinners now. Uh, as you look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he left heaven and he became a man. And as we look at it, every one of, of the folks in his lineage... We started from uh, Matthew chapter 1, and we went through it one by one on his family tree. Uh, we looked at David. We looked at uh, um, how he was a sinner. Uh, in verse 3, a woman called Tamar, where she, she was the great, 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 great grandmother of our Lord, a prostitute. Uh, we looked then at, in verse 5 of Matthew 1. At Salmon, who begot Boaz of, of Rahab, who, who was Rahab? Rahab was also a, a prostitute. Um, and as you look at it, Jesus Christ became and proved that he loves us and proved that he has become your friend and my friend. Number one was he was incarnated, although didn't have any sin because his father was not Joseph. His father was the heavenly father. Uh, so he didn't have the bruise and the sin of uh, his, his, uh, his earthly family on him. But uh, he loved sinners. He came down here and identified himself with us. He made himself of no reputation. He clothed himself in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
and he proved his love to you and me because he became like you and I. And this is very, very, very important for you and I to really understand why Jesus became my friend. Number one, he left his glory in heaven and uh, he proved it by becoming, uh, coming down to this earth um, through a lineage and, and generation that were full of sinners. The second reason why I believe Jesus is the friend of sinners is, um, and he proves his love um, for sinners is by his association. So first, by his incarnation. Second, by his association. Now, you don't find the Savior standing at a distance issuing laws and commandments and statutes and orders to people. You don't see him standing up on high somewhere in the White House and just shaking his hand and telling people what to do at a distance. You don't find our Lord writing what we call prescriptions uh, at a distance and sending these prescriptions for healing to the people by the hands of his disciples. But you find our Lord coming right down among, among the defiled, don't you? He touched people that nobody would ever want to touch. Nobody. You find our Lord coming right down among the sinful. You find our Lord sitting at the table with them. You find our Lord with his arms about them. You find our Lord eating with them. You find our Lord up to his neck in guilty, guilty men and women. He loved them. He loved them. Our Lord sits at the Pharisee's table and he was so identified with sinners and so associated with sinners that a woman, now listen to this, the woman, a woman of the street was not afraid to come in and kneel at his feet and bathe them with tears and dry his feet with the hair of her head. She was not afraid to do that. That's very important. You find our Lord sending his disciples on into town, into Samaria, and he sits down on a well, and here comes a young woman who had been married five times. And at that time was living with a man who was not even her husband in John chapter 4. You don't find Jesus running away when he knew, as he knows everything, that she was a sinner. You don't find that. You find him there with her. And our Lord Jesus, in, instead of being repelled, instead of pulling his coat up around him and, and lowering his eyes, uh, that I don't want to talk to you to the ground and sneaking away to keep from uh, being seen with her. Uh, keep from being identified with sinners. Keep from being associating with sinners. He sat on the well and asked her to give him a drink of water. You see what I'm saying to you? He proves his love to, to sinners. Not only he was incarnated, but he also is associating with this crowd of sinners. Would you give me a drink of water, please, ma'am, right? And he said, how come, she said, how come you, a Jew, is asking me, a Samaritan, now Samaritans were mixed blood with Assyrians. When Assyrians took them captive, they believed that the blood was mixed, so they married and so they weren't pure. And so Samaritans will never, never, never liked by the Jews, never. So she said to him, how come you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? Don't you know that the Jews don't have anything to do with folks like me? Why is he doing this? You know? 
Why is he doing this? It's amazing to me. This is God. This is not just a good guy. He's not one of them nice elders you have in churches where they come and hug you every time and ask you how you're doing. This is God Almighty. And our Lord said, if you knew who it is that is asking you for a drink a water, you would ask me, and I would give you the water of life. The discussion changes. Our Lord loves sinners. He gives sinners hope. He wants to give her the water of life. He called, you remember Zacchaeus, the little dude, Zacchaeus, a tax collector in Luke chapter 19. He calls to Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus who made his living cheating the Jews, right? Zacchaeus who sat down to figure out a man's tax and put in a 40% deal for himself. Zacchaeus who prayed on the poor. He didn't go after the rich. He didn't go after the Romans. He went after the poor Israelis, the Jews. Zacchaeus who climbed up on the tree out of curiosity to see the Lord. And we find our Savior not ignoring him, not passing by him. We find our Savior stopping under the tree and calling out, Zacchaeus, you must come down. You come down, Mr. Zacchaeus. And this shocked the whole religious system. The whole system. I am going to have dinner with you tonight, Zacchaeus. I must. Not that, hey, can you please go ask your wife? And if it's okay, we will come with our disciples, you know, around 8 p.m. Uh, and maybe if you don't have room, we'll just uh, excuse 10 of them. And it's only going to be me and John and Peter, you know? It's okay. No, 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 no. Jesus says, I must. We are coming. Doesn't he know who this man is? He knows who this man is very well. That's the kind of folks he came to save. It is in that very chapter that Christ said in Luke 19.10, what did he say? The famous verse, the Son of Man, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save who? To seek and to save the good people, to seek and to save the righteous, to seek and to save the Israelis or the Assyrians. Who did he come to save? The white, the black, the orange, the yellow. Who did he come to save? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The lost. He came to save the lost. Our Lord didn't come to call the preachers. Our Lord didn't come to call the priests. Our Lord didn't come to call the Pharisee. Our Lord didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners to repentance. It's very important. He proves his love to his sinners, not only because he was incarnated, but he was also associating with sinners. Who do we associate with? Yesterday, there was a man that came to our work and he was a homeless person. And as soon as he entered the lobby, the whole place was full of smell, of alcohol and of other smells. Nobody wanted to associate it with him, especially with COVID. Six feet away, they're poking him out of the door, right? They're scared of COVID-19. Nobody wants to touch him. Nobody wants to associate with this kind of man. Our Lord stop, stoops by the woman taken in sin. You remember that? In John chapter 8, the Pharisees uh, were always out looking for somebody who had fallen because they thought they were very good. They're going to find somebody worse than them, somebody to exercise their discipline upon. We're good. We need to find somebody to kind of discipline and make an example to other people. And finally, they found one at the very act, and they brought her, and Jesus Christ was standing there, and they threw her on the ground. 
And they said, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. They walked in. There wasn't no cameras or no spyware or malware or thisware and thatware. They just walked in and they caught her. They didn't bring the man. They brought the woman. Moses' law says, stone her. What do you say? John chapter 8. Remember? You know the story. And Jesus, Lord Jesus didn't say anything. He stooped down beside the poor sinful woman and he began to write on the ground without saying a word. I don't know what he wrote. Some people start guessing he wrote this or that. I don't know what he wrote. Some people wrote, some people say he wrote, he was writing some names of places and some, some fellow that would recognize, I don't know. But I am telling you this. The scripture says beginning, and he, what did he tell them? If you have no sin, a man without sin, throw the first stone. And, and the scripture says beginning at the oldest, clear down to the youngest. They all strangely found somewhere else to go at the particular time. They found some unfinished business somewhere else to attend to. They dropped those stones and then walked out. And when our Lord got through writing there on the sand, the woman sin that was displayed publicly in front of everybody, you know, our sin is mostly in secret, isn't it? We think we only know when we sin. This woman's sin was displayed in public. Their sin, those that all of a sudden found somewhere to be, their sin was in secret. That's why they just left, because they weren't going to get exposed in front of everybody else. They're too proud to be humbled. They're too proud to confess their sins. He stood up and they were all gone. And he looked down at this woman and he said, woman, where are the men who were accusing you? What happened to them? Does no man accuse you anymore? And she said, no, Lord. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Our Lord erected his cross between two thieves, right? And that's where he died. And that's where he redeemed this world. And that's where he came down and accomplished his father's task between two thieves. Not on the altar of a church. And not on a sacred, holy place, but between two thieves. And then he made his grave. The scripture said, with the wicked and with the rich, our Lord never preached so sweetly. Our Lord never uttered words so kind than when he was speaking to sinners, but didn't he? Remember and recall in your memory what you know of Jesus and what he said. The most sweet, the most pleasant, the most loving words coming out of our Lord's mouth are to sinners, isn't it? Isn't it? And let me tell you, he never spoke more sharply than when he was speaking and rebuking speaking and rebuking a self-righteous man or a woman. Do you, see the, uh, do you see the difference? The way he spoke to sinners versus the way he spoke to the self-righteous men and women. So sweet with sinners, so sharp with self-righteous people. Our Lord's words cut like a sword. Our Lord's pierced to the very narrow, marrow of the bone when he was talking to a religious hypocrite. Very harsh languages. Read the Gospel of Matthew. Read John. 
read it. But oh, when he was talking to a sinner, his words were sweet as honey. He was kind. Why? Because he loved them. He proved his love not only by his incarnation, but also by his association. He did what he preached. That's the difficulty with us. We are associating with God only when we are in his presence in church. And then we forget who we are. We forget that we are his disciples. We forget for six days how we are to live. But don't forget, our God loves sinners. The problem is we can't find any. That's the problem we have today. I'm having a hard time finding sinners. I ask people, they don't, they, they don't think they're sinners. So I go, out, I go around, even that homeless guy yesterday, I asked him, he, he, he didn't want sin. He didn't want to talk about that. He just wanted alcohol. Now, the third reason I believe that our Lord proved his love to, for sinners is by his sermons. And, and I look at his sermons, and, and I studied those sermons. And some of them we have reviewed here together. So I'm not going to take time on them, developing them. But listen to him as he tells the story, three stories in Luke chapter 15. One of them is the, 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 the preaching on the lost sheep. He said uh, there were 99 sheep in the fold, and the man went there, and there was one missing. A man left the 99. In the, feet, in the fold, and he went out on the hillside and he walked through the rain and storm and he and the wind and he and the cold, and he found finally his sheep. And he picked it up and he put it on his shoulder. And rejoicing, he bore it home. And he cried out to his friends and neighbors, What did he say? He didn't say, I found a dumb one. Finally, we're going to discipline him. No, we're going to put him in jail. No, he didn't bring him down. He lifted him up. He said, rejoice with me. I found my sheep. And he said, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. Can I ask you a question? Do you think you have ever caused joy in heaven because you have shared the gospel with a lost sinner? As a result, there is joy in the presence of the angel over one sinner that repents. Have we? Do we? Do we dare in this world where they forbid us to go to church, forbid us to worship, forbid us to sing and to praise? Do we dare talk about Jesus? Oh, the, the, the issues that we are facing today. But the scripture is very clear. He found the sheep. He put it on his shoulder. He brought her home. And he told his neighbors, rejoice with me because I have found my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep follow me. And there is joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. Right after that, he tells the second sermon. It's a message about a woman who lost a coin and she swept the house. Back then, they didn't have vacuum cleaners. So she swept the house. And she got a light, no, no solar powered, probably a candle. She got a light and she looked down and finally she, went, she found that coin. And she put it with the rest of them and she called in her neighbors and says, I have found my coin. 
that was lost, rejoice with me. And then right after that, he tells a story about a lost son. And he said the boy came to himself after he left his daddy down in the rail of the pig pens eating the husks. And he said to himself, how many servants my are in my father's house and they have plenty to eat and a good place to sleep and plenty to wear. And I'm here dying of hunger. What have I done? I'm going to go home and I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven in thy sight and I am not worthy. I'm not coming to be your son. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me uh, one of them hired servants. That's plenty for me. And when the father saw him coming a long way off, you remember this, right? He ran with open arms and greeted him. And he called the neighbors and friends. And he said, kill the fattened calf. My son was lost. And now he is found. And Christ said, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that comes to repentance. You see his sermons? It's all about loving sinners. It's all about the lost. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me, all ye, what? Who? Come unto me, who? All of you rich folks that don't need me, all of the, all the folks that think they're good enough that, that I need to logically explain to them. No, 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 no. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I, I will give you what? Money? Love? No, I will give you rest. Come unto me. If you're not heavy, uh, if you're not heavy laden, and if you're not in labor, if you're not humbled, you will never come unto him. If you're like a son sitting at the home, eating and drinking and not caring, and you haven't been lost, you will be never be found, never. If you want to be found, my friend, you got to get lost first. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 7, 73, the last day of the feast, he stood on Solomon's porch and, and watched these people going away from all of these religious ceremonies. They came just because of that ceremony. They all leaving empty. They're just checking the box. Like we do when we go to church. Check the box. And he's standing there on Solomon's porch, watching all of these people going away from their religious ceremonies empty. And then he cries out with a loud voice and saying, everybody that is thirsty, come unto me. If you are thirsty, come unto me. If you are weary, come unto me. If you are heavy laden, you come unto me. If you are naked, you come unto me. And if you are miserable, and if you are poor, and if you are blind, come to me and I will give you rest. You see what I'm saying? If we don't know who we are, we will not go to him because we don't know we are poor. We don't know we, we are in need. We don't know we think we're good. Remember in Revelation 3, there is this uh, wonderful passage when, where, where the scripture says in Revelation 3, verse 14, I love this, and, and unto the angel of the church of Lodi, Lodikians, right? One of those seven churches. These things says the amen. Now listen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is what Jesus is saying. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. This, this really resonates with our world today. We are neither cold 
nor hot. I would thou were called or hot. I'd rather you be called or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest now, look at this, I am rich and I have increased with goods and have need of nothing. This is the this is what happens to the to the world without God. Because you say I am rich, the scripture says. Revelation 3 17. And I have increased with goods. The stock market is all time high. And I have need of nothing. And you know what the scripture says? And you don't know that you are wretched, that you are miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what the scripture says. It is a very powerful um, message for us, although very simple, but very powerful to know that our Lord Jesus Christ is a friend of sinners, number one, because he proved his love for sinners by his incarnation. Second, by his association. Third, by his sermon. And fourth, which we will study next Wednesday, by his prayers. We will look at some of his prayers, uh, how he associates himself with sinners. Now, the real question for us today is, is he our friend or not? Now, I'm not saying, um, do you know how to go to him in prayer? Because we are created that way. If you are ever brought up in a Christian family, the first thing that you do when something bad happens is you get on your knees because your grandmother used to, and your mom and your dad. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm not asking if you know how to pray. I'm asking you if he is your friend. I'm not asking you if you know how to dial 1-800 Jesus when you need him. But a friend is closer than a brother, the Bible says. If he's right there with you 24-7. And that's the key. Do we resonate when he talks about a lost coin? Does it work with you when he talks about a lost sheep? What about a lost son? Do you see yourself in those pictures? Do I see myself as a lost soul because of my sin? Do I think that I'm increased with goods and I am rich and I don't need anything? Like that man who made a lot of crop and he thought he's set for life. You know, all I got to do is sell a couple of these real estate homes and that's it. I'm done for 20 years. That's it. And he didn't know that he was dying that night. And the Bible doesn't call him a smart businessman because he was smart, right? He, he, he did good in business, but the Bible calls him a fool. A fool. You can have all the world, but you can, you will miss Jesus, then you have nothing. You have nothing. There's a song that says, I'd rather have Jesus. You remember that song? I'd rather have Jesus more than silver and gold. As we look at this, I want you to really think about it. If we are heavy laden, the scripture says, come on to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Shall we pray? Oh, Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence again. We know that uh, we are in need of you because we are sinners. And the scripture says that you have become the friend of sinners through your incarnation, through your association with us, and through your sermons. 
may it be that we would be like that woman who was a sinner and she ran to you no matter who was around you or her and she just knelt by your feet may we run to you not to church not to 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 uh, jerusalem not to a cross but to you not to a statue an idol but to you and um and ask for forgiveness because we're sinners. Heavenly Father, as we approach um, the day of your birth upon this world, may we recognize more than ever that we need you and this community needs you and our world needs you. Our country, our rulers, presidents need you. May you bless them and give them guidance and Put your fear in our hearts and their hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.